work Wednesday. So thanks to you for joining us for Remote Work Wednesday. Um, on behalf of the Remote Online Initiative and the K-State Research and Extension Community Vitality Team, uh, we would like to welcome you. My name is Ron Wilson. I'm with the uh, Huck Boyd Institute for Rural Development. Um, big thanks to Deborah Cole, who is uh, programming with us from Hutchinson today. Uh, Deborah is the Program Leader Coordinator for the K-State Research, Research and Extension Community Vitality Team of which I'm a part as well. This uh, call is a project of the Remote Online Initiative, and I would refer you to the website, kansasremotework.com. Uh, in partnership with Utah State, in fact, we're offering month-long online classes for those who want to be trained and certified as remote workers or remote work team supervisors. So we're offering that class, and that has led to, to this call, uh, which is a monthly Zoom uh, for anyone interested in remote work, a free call. The goal is simply to understand the challenges and opportunities of working remotely or in a hybrid setting for those who choose to do that. A free call on the second Wednesday of each month. And in fact, next month, uh, Remote Work Wednesday will feature Ashley Como uh, on July 10, uh, talking about remote work as it applies in her particular setting. As we all know, the pandemic of 2020 changed all our work patterns. Suddenly we were all stuck at home, uh, no choice. Uh, and some of us continue to work remotely or, or in a hybrid format. Um, for a lot of us, that means we're stuck in front of a computer sp screen for hours on end and uh, and maybe even not even leaving our, our home in the course of the work day. So what does this mean for our physical and mental health? Well, we know that physical health matters. And we have a, an expert, fortunately, who can talk to us about these issues today. Dr. Emily Maley is an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology at K-State. She earned her BA in Exercise Science and Psychology at St. Olaf's College in Minnesota, her master's at Ball State in uh, Indiana, and her PhD at the University of Illinois. Emily came to K-State in 2012. She's risen to become the graduate program director uh, in the department and director of the Physical Activity Intervention Research Lab. Her research focuses on developing and implementing interventions to promote physical activity and reduce sedentary behavior in multiple populations, and she's worked with a whole range. It's interesting, during the early COVID pandemic, she developed a program called Stand Up Kansas, uh, which was intended to help employees reduce sitting time while working from home. Perfect uh, Perfect topic for us today. She says when she's not working, she tries to practice what she preaches by staying active with her family. In fact, uh, was just out uh, visiting some national parks in Utah last week. So with that, Dr. Maley, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Looks good. Okay. Okay. Are you seeing the notes version or the? We are seeing a notes version with the next slide on the panel on the right. So okay. there that? we go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I am excited to talk to you today. Um, the presentation will focus on physical activity and sedentary behavior specifically as aspects that can promote both physical and mental health um, and some of the unique, as Ron says, challenges and opportunities associated with um, being active when you are working from home. Um, so he already sort of introduced my research interests. Um, I've worked with uh, a lot of different groups and populations to help them uh, develop motivation and skills to um, integrate physical activity into their lives, as well as reduce the amount of time that they spent sitting. Um, and uh, as Ron said as well, uh, I love to be active myself and uh, especially spend time outdoors with my family. Um, so today I wanted to, I do want to tell you a little bit about our Stand Up Kansas project um, and because it's it's relevant to um, what we're talking about today. Um, and then we'll talk about 
uh, you know, what are the reasons why you might want to be active and integrate movement into your day? Um, and then what are some of the specific strategies and skills that you can use um, to realize those goals that you might have? Um, so very briefly, uh, you may or may not be familiar with the physical activity guidelines, but I would I thought I would start by just um, showing these if you're not familiar with them. These are our federal physical activity guidelines that were um, adapted in 2018. And so the core recommendation oops, is to engage in at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. Um, so that breaks down to roughly 30 minutes, five days per week. Um, but you don't have to do that in 30 minute bouts. You can break that up uh, in any way that works for you and do any type of activity that sort of uh, gets your blood flowing and gets your heart pumping to get to that moderate activity range. And the guidelines also recommend two days per week of muscle strengthening activity. Um, however, I think it's helpful not to think of physical activity just in terms of sort of planned exercise that you might do. Um, that's one way that you can accumulate physical activity in your day. Um, but really, our days are more of a 24-hour spectrum where we can think about not only increasing exercise, but also trying to reduce the amount of time that we spend sitting and uh, just increasing the amount of time that we spend moving um, throughout the day. So hopefully this presentation will give you some ideas uh, that sort of hit on all three of these different goals. Um, there are well-documented benefits, of course, of physical activity, but also of reducing sedentary behavior. So um, we know that even if you're someone who maybe gets up and exercises regularly for 30 minutes every morning before you start your day, um, if you spend the entire rest of your day sitting, there's still some potential health complications associated mm -hmm. with that sedentary behavior. Um, and I won't go deep into the physiology, but essentially you're, when you're sitting, your major muscle groups are dormant they're not working so they're not having to use um they're not taking in blood sugars and so the processes that um use like fats and sugars are are stalled when you're sitting um the good news is by simply standing up and interrupting that sitting you sort of restart those processes and undo uh some of the detrimental physiology physiological effects of sitting. So uh, a lot of the research suggests that the most important thing is the frequency with which you interrupt your sitting, not necessarily that you're getting up and doing something rigorous uh, every time or that you're having long bouts of exercise. Um, so the physiology is important, but I also uh, think it's really important to stress some of the mental health benefits of physical activity and sitting less, um, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but um, we know that moving more and sitting less helps people feel more energized, less tired, can improve our mood, help us feel less stressed, etc. cetera. So um, being mindful of the physical benefits is helpful, but a lot of times those aren't the things that really motivate us to want to move in the immediate moment because we're not really uh, getting any regular feedback that our glucose is improving or our blood pressure is improving, but I can notice right away that I feel less tired or less anxious. So um, a little bit about the Stand Up Kansas project that I mentioned. Um, we started this project, I think it was in October or November of 2020. So pretty early during the pandemic when most uh, everybody at K-State uh, was still working primarily from home. And so originally this was going to be a project that we did with work sites. And then we sort of pivoted as many people did um, to address the issue of sedentary behavior while working from home. And 
For this project, we had two different approaches that we were kind of implementing and testing in terms of reducing sitting time. Um, the first was uh, giving people a height adjustable desk to work uh, to use at home. So that can quickly transition from a sitting to a standing posture. And then the second approach was a 12 week online uh, kind of behavioral support program where we worked with participants to set goals and uh, come up with strategies to overcome barriers, um, et cetera. So we tested each of these components alone and then also had a group that received both to, to sort of tease apart the individual and combined effects of each of these interventions. Um, and so these were the main results. Our main outcome was minutes of sitting during the workday. This was measured via five-day activity logs that participants completed before they started the intervention and then after 12 weeks. Um, and at the bottom, you can see the number of minutes of uh, reduced sitting in each of the groups. Um, so the participants who received just the desk reported sitting about two hours less per workday after 12 weeks. The participants who received just the program, it was about an hour and a half. And then we saw the largest changes in those who received both the desk and the program, um, I think almost three and a half hours per day less. So roughly cut their sitting time in half uh, through participating in this intervention. Uh, the other results that I'll briefly share, um, and don't get too hung up on the statistics here, um, these are effect sizes that show um, changes or improvements in some outcomes that we are interested in. Again, more related to mental health as well as work satisfaction and productivity. Um, so the numbers that are highlighted in red are the ones that are sort of moderate to large um, improvements. And so you can see, again, in the group that received both the desk and the program, they were reporting large improvements in mood, um, reductions in fatigue, and improvements in focus, work satisfaction, and productivity. So uh, we were really encouraged by this to see that not only were they reducing sitting, but also seemed to be feeling better as a function of that. Um, I guess, I don't know if people are participating, but I'd like to pause there and just ask if anybody has any questions that you wanna uh, unmute and ask or type into the chat about that study. Um, I'll give just, a few seconds and then if there's no questions, we can keep going. Not, okay. Not seeing any questions in the chat. Okay, so uh, we'll keep going, but I am gonna ask if you're here, I'm gonna ask you to add something to the chat in a minute. So be ready for that. Um, so let's start by talking a little bit about motivation and what are some of the reasons that you might think about for trying to be more active um, during your workday. Um, this figure comes from my one of my colleagues, Michelle Seeger, who has done a lot of really interesting research with motivation. Um, and what this is illustrating is the messages that we are uh, kind of inundated with and typically exposed to in terms of reasons why we should be physically active, often focus heavily on these future-oriented health and weight-related outcomes. So I feel like I'm supposed to exercise because my doctor said I have high cholesterol or um, I need to lose weight or uh, it's supposed to improve my life expectancy. So these are sort of the reasons that we hear and think about a lot of times with physical activity. Um, but what this figure illustrates is often that makes physical activity feel like a chore to us. It's another thing that I have to do that I'm supposed to do. And so I do it for a while, but then I get busy. I prioritize other things that I enjoy more. Um, and it's sort of this vicious cycle. And so uh, Dr. Seeger and I sort of agree that a uh, more effective motivational perspective is to focus on how physical activity can help uh, help me feel better right now. And she calls these the right why. 
Uh, it might be a little bit hard to see the figure, but some of the immediate benefits of physical activity that I already mentioned are, it can help me have more energy, uh, be in a better mood, help me connect with others. Um, and what this figure illustrates is that that really makes it feel more like a gift. It makes it something that I actually want to prioritize and look for ways to um, fit it into my life. Um, and then I'm more successful in sustaining it over time. So uh, you may or may not have thought about this for yourself, but I encourage you to think about, you know, when you think of exercise, what are some of the, the first reasons that come to mind in terms of uh, do you do you look at it as another chore that you have to add to your to-do list, or does it really feel like something that you want to do? Um, and the good news is that we do have good evidence that physical activity or exercise can have a lot of these immediate benefits. So um, it can help people feel less stressed, less tired, more focused, et cetera, which uh, as a whole contribute to something that, you know, probably we all want to do is, you know, feel good, feel happy, feel productive in our daily lives. Um, these are a couple of quotes from our Stand Up Kansas participants that sort of uh, illustrate that they did experience some of these benefits. So I won't read them all. Um, but you can sort of skim through them. And we saw this common theme that um, participants did feel like they had more energy. They felt like they could focus more. Um, they felt like they were just more aware of um, the need to move and then how they felt better when they did move or when they did stand. Um, and, it, and then it sort of made them want to be more active in other parts of their lives as well. All right, Nilda said, want to do in the spring and fall more of a chore in summer and the winter. I can definitely relate to that in terms of uh, weather. So thank you for uh, chiming in there. Okay, so if, if you take a few minutes, you know, at some point to think about what you feel like are your are your driving motives and and are they more kind of internal things about feeling better or are they more external expectations about wanting to have your appearance be a certain way or your health numbers be a certain way and see if you can identify a few kind of internal reasons that really resonate with you and align with the things you value and i think then as i said that provides a stronger foundation for wanting to be active and looking for ways to carve out the time to do it. So for most of the rest of this time, I wanna focus on the how piece um, and give you some ideas about kind of some tangible strategies that you might implement if this is a goal that you have. All right, this is a, the slide where I thought we could maybe try to have a little bit of interaction. Um, again, you can unmute and share or type something in the chat, but whether you are working from home now, planning to work from home in the future, or maybe had experience with it during the uh, early part of the pandemic, uh, I'm curious to know, what do you see as the biggest barriers to um, being active in the when you're working from home? I do think that if I'm hyper-focused on a project, I lose track of time and yeah. uh, and I turn around and suddenly more time has gotten away than I ever, ever realized sometimes. Yeah, definitely. It's easy to kind of get absorbed in your work and um, just kind of forget to get up or take breaks. And for that matter, in the crunch time of COVID, when we were doing Zoom calls back to back to back, <laughs> didn't have much flexibility yeah definitely I think I can definitely relate to that you know early in the pandemic going from being on campus co you know commuting to and from campus walking to meetings and classes to then suddenly feeling like you're confined to a single room and just staring at a computer screen all day um so it definitely felt even maybe harder than ever to um, reduce sedentary time in that environment. Um, 
So, oh, let me see. Nailed this. <laughs> said, I like to go outside, but I'm in a rural area and need to spray for bugs, but I hate the smell of bug spray. Yeah, so that's a good, that's a unique barrier. Uh, you maybe don't want to um, apply bug spray just to take a, a quick five minute break outside. Um, so, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, and we'll talk later maybe about some strategies that you can think about for addressing some of these barriers. Um, so some of the common things that we've heard in the home environment, um, again, as Ron said, kind of getting absorbed in your work, um, have, being in front of a screen all day. Um, and a lot of times there's just not the need to get up and move as there might be in, the, um, in an office environment. Um, I'm just reading Adam's comment, different expectations of availability. Um, so missing a call for work while remote may be interpreted differently than missing a call while in the office. Okay. Yeah, that's a great point. And so maybe feeling like you have to be uh, at your desk or at your phone all the time, if I'm interpreting that correctly. Um, so the the take home message here is that there's a lot that gets in the way. And so this is a, a context where we really have to be intentional about kind of inserting movement into our day, or it's very easy to go through the whole day uh, without moving at all. I also thought I would quickly acknowledge a few of the potential benefits or facilitators in the home environment. So you may have more flexibility in terms of what you can wear, uh, having comfortable clothes or at least comfortable shorts or pants on the, uh, the bottom half uh, in that environment. Uh, depending on your job, you may or may not have some more flexibility in your schedule. Um, and then you may not be contending with some of the social norms that you would in the office. So if there's a type of exercise or movement that you like to do, but you would feel weird doing it in front of other people, um, maybe that's not an issue if you're by yourself working from home. Um, so one of the first things that I would encourage you to think about is, you know, if you were to get up and be active during the day, um, what activities uh, would you want to do? Um, and when I say the right activities, uh, what I really mean are the activities that check all these boxes here. So the right activity is probably different for every one of you that's listening right now. Um, but the bottom line is that it should be something that you enjoy and look forward to doing, it should be something that's feasible to fit uh, into your day. Um, and that you feel capable um, of doing the activity. And starting with this foundation of an activity that you really want to do uh, can help with all the other pieces of following through on that activity. Um, so during this presentation, I'll share a couple examples of kind of worksheets or activities that I've used with different interventions or different participants. Um, and so I'd be happy to send these out afterwards, or uh, you're welcome to take a, a screenshot or a picture if you think this is helpful. Um, but this is an activity that I've used to help people just brainstorm a whole bunch of different activities that they could maybe try, um, and then sort of rate them in terms of, are you confident to do this? Is it convenient? Um, what are some strategies that you could use to make it more enjoyable, et cetera. And then you can sort of use this as a starting point to try out the activities that you're most confident doing and are most convenient for your current um, situation. Um, if you're at a point right now where you're not doing much physical activity, you are spending uh, you know, the whole day sitting, then I would encourage you to start by just thinking about little things you could maybe do to try to sit less throughout the day. Um, as I said, both physiologically and kind of from a behavioral perspective, the research suggests that taking shorter but more frequent breaks is the optimal approach to interrupting sitting. As I said, you're sort of uh, jump-starting the, the blood flow to your muscles and your, your brain every time you get up and move around a little bit. Um, 
you could think about ways to combine movement with other things that you have to do at the house if you're working from home. So uh, a few examples here. Um, a, a small strategy that some of our participants in Stand Up Kansas really liked was the idea of uh, keeping a small cup on their desk. Um, so uh, it helps with hydration. Uh, when you're well hydrated, you have to get up and go to the bathroom more. Um, and rather than having like a 50 ounce um, tumbler on the desk, just having a small cup that you sort of have to get up and refill more often was an easy uh, strategy and reminder to just interrupt sitting uh, more frequently throughout the day. Um, the figure on the right here is a dry erase board that we gave our participants in Stand Up Kansas. And so it had the opportunity for them to um, really to come up with a goal and then write it down and sort of monitor their progress. Um, so I think, you know, anytime we write our goals down, it sort of reinforces our commitment to what we're trying to do. Um, so it's helpful. Uh, even if you don't have a formal dry erase board to maybe have a post-it note or something where you have a reminder of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. All right, so then we get to the issue that, that Ron raised, which is we might have uh, excellent aspirations to get up and move more, but then um, we get absorbed in work and you know, the hour marker goes by and all of a sudden we realize that uh, we didn't get up and take the break that we had intended. So there's a lot of different technology that you could potentially use to help um, prompt or remind you to get up and move. Um, and again, this is a situation where it's really about figuring out what works for you and your unique situation. So, um, you could set a recurring alarm on your phone, um, but here I've also listed some different apps for uh, either installing on the computer or installing on the phone um, that can help remind you to you take breaks. And, and some of them have different features in terms of nagging you or how disruptive they are. Uh, there may be some that go as far as sort of like locking, your, locking you out of your computer, which most people don't want, um, but again, it's really up to you what uh, what kind of system is going to work for you. Um, an alternative to that is uh, if you're someone that feels like it's really disruptive and you, you don't want to be interrupted and have to get up and do something right when you're in the middle of something, the idea of tiny habits is sort of a more natural way to build activity into your existing routine. Um, and Tiny Habits comes from a book by B.J. Fogg, who's pictured here. So this isn't my original idea. Um, but his idea is if you're building a tiny habit, you take something that you're already doing uh, consistently that's already a habit in your life and you sort of link or sequence the new behavior that you want to do right after that. So here's a couple of examples that could maybe be relevant to the workday. Um, sending emails is probably something that lots of you do frequently throughout the day. And so you could have a tiny habit that says, you know, after I press send on an email, I will stand up and stretch. And so then you're sort of fitting the behavior into your routine and using some of those natural breaks as prompts to get up and move. Um, a, a few key points for tiny habits is it's important to really make the new behavior uh, tiny. So I don't want to say, you know, every time my Zoom meeting ends, I'm going to go walk for 30 minutes or do 50 push ups or something that feels hard. Um, because uh, then it's not something that fits easily into my routine anymore and we get back to it feeling disruptive. Um, so starting really small and choosing something that you reliably do as your anchor um, can sort of help build these new behaviors into your day. Um, so you might be wondering, is, is that really sufficient? You know, is doing two squats or 
three jumping jacks enough to notice, um, you know, benefits to my physical or mental health. Um, the tiny behaviors may or may not be, um, but what you're doing with this is um, sort of building strong roots to grow bigger habits from there. Um, so if you're someone who looks at the physical activity guidelines of 150 minutes per week, and that feels really overwhelming to you and you really aren't sure where you would start, Tiny Habits is a way to break that down into really small chunks that feel manageable and allow you to experience some success. And then you can always build up from there because each time you're successful, um, you might feel more motivated to want to do more and you and feel more confident in your ability to build this activity into your day. Oops. Um, so up to this point, uh, I've been thinking primarily and talking primarily in terms of reducing sitting. Um, if you are already getting up and moving or you feel like uh, you really want to move towards increasing physical activity and being more intentional about incorporating physical activity into your day. Uh, I want to spend a few minutes talking about some strategies um, specific to that. So if you have kind of developed a habit of getting up and moving and you feel like you're ready to scale that up a little bit, you could start increasing the duration or the intensity of the activity that you're doing. Um, just like with sedentary behavior, it's still important to smart start small here. So you don't have to go right to 30 or 60 minutes per day. Uh, you know, challenge yourself to just take a couple of five minute breaks per day as you're getting started. Um, again, identify activities that you enjoy and want to do. Uh, having that motivation is really helpful. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about Kind of strategies for planning those breaks into your day. Um, I don't know. It depends on your role, probably, in terms of whether you're able, if you're in Zoom meetings or virtual meetings, if you're able to um, turn off your camera. And maybe it depends on the meeting, whether that's possible. Um, but for example, right now, if you're listening to this and have your camera off, it could be a good opportunity to stand up and move around, do some some stretches or uh, squats or march in place or whatever it is uh, while you are watching the webinar. So think about whether there's opportunities to do that during your regular meetings as you work. Um, okay, so we'll talk about kind of six different strategies that you could potentially use to help you be successful in increasing your physical activity. Um, primarily think about during the workday, but this could also be sort of before or after work as well. So first strategy is uh, set goals and make your goals uh, as specific as possible. Um, so sometimes we say my goal is to be more active, but that doesn't give us any uh, specific roadmap in terms of what is it exactly that I wanna do? How am I gonna know when I've achieved that goal? So the more details you can include in terms of exactly what you wanna do and when and where you'll do it, um, the more you'll be setting yourself up for success um, to achieve that goal. So there's an example uh, of a goal here that sort of checks those boxes. Um, I like to encourage people to focus on process goals. Um, process goals are goals for what are the actions or behaviors that I'm going to do. A lot of times uh, we gravitate towards outcome goals, like I want to lose a certain amount of weight. Um, but those goals can be hard to measure your progress and feel like you're making progress and sometimes feel a little bit outside of our and control. So process goals really put the, um, make me feel like I'm in control of whether or not I achieve this or not. Um, and I also encourage people to set goals to start small. Um, you can always build up from there, but again, those early success experiences are really important, um, to be able to fuel you to continue to want to do more in the future. Uh, next strategy is planning. Um, we refer to this as action planning in our field, which is, 
specifying exactly when and where you're going to do the behavior. So here, my goal is to walk for 20 minutes three times per week. Um, now I've specified that I'm going to do this uh, during my lunch hour. I should have actually also added which day is here. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or something like that. So I can put that on my calendar, uh, have the time reserved so it doesn't, you know, I don't get to the end of the day and it hasn't happened. Um, and this process, in addition to help me plan ahead and maybe, you know, have my clothes and shoes ready, make sure I don't schedule any meetings during that time. It also reduces the cognitive deliberation of, you know, relying on some motivation or willpower or relying on me to say, I just want to get up and move right now. Um, I sort of know that when that time comes on my schedule, I'm just going to get up and do it. So uh, planning ahead helps a lot. Uh, we talked earlier a little bit about barriers. Um, barriers are something that everybody experiences and encounters. They are a normal part of the process. We all are going to have uh, setbacks along the way. So we need to normalize that that, that happens. Um, but then think about, you know, sometimes barriers come out of the blue and there's nothing that we can do about it. We get sick or our kids get sick or something comes up at work that we just have to do right now. Um, but other times, uh, they're sort of the same things that get in the way over and over again. So if we can identify those things and try to have some plans in place uh, in advance, that can help us feel and be more prepared to overcome those barriers. So I put a few examples here. There's a lot of text, but certainly lack of time is one of the most consistent barriers that people experience when it comes to physical activity. Um, so, you know, here's some strategies that I came up with where I'm just going to try to focus on taking a couple minutes at a time to get up and move around frequently, combining those tasks with other things I need to do either for work, like talking on the phone or at home, getting laundry done, et cetera. Um, so try to think ahead about what are your biggest challenges and see if you can brainstorm some potential strategies that might work for you. Um, and it's also important to, to recognize that these strategies really have to be individualized and tailored to you. So uh, what works for one person may not be what works for another. So it's an experimental process where you can keep trying different solutions until you find something that sticks. Uh, another strategy that we recommend is somehow keeping track of your progress. So we call this self-monitoring. Um, here's the, on the right is the dry erase board again that we used. Um, this, this time it's using it in a different way to set a goal for accumulating a certain amount of steps and keeping track of taking a walk every day during lunch. Um, so that's one example. The other two examples here are other logs that we've used with participants where you're keeping track of what you did, how you felt, do you want to do it again, et cetera. Or in the case of the bottom one, if you had a, a goal that you weren't able to accomplish, sort of going back and analyzing what got in the way, what could I do differently the next time. So again, I'm happy to share these. Um, you can, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter how you monitor your progress, as long as it's something that sort of fits into your um, routine and keeps track of the things that that work for you. Uh, Ron said, makes me think of Walk Kansas program. Yes, I think they incorporate a lot of uh, these types of resources to try to uh, get people actively engaged in the process um, it's important after you set a goal to keep track of it so that it continues to be on your radar and you're continuing to kind of think about strategies to, to, to move throughout the day. Uh, social support is another thing that's important to talk about and, and can be kind of challenging, I think, in the remote work environment. So um, if you are sort of by yourself at home, you might need to be a little bit creative about how you could get support from family and friends if the, if you you know don't have someone to walk or be active with in person could you um 
call a friend while you are walking or kind of use like an app or activity tracker to have some sort of step challenge. Um, talk to your family and friends, tell them about your goals and how they can support you. Um, I also want to encourage you to think about social support in the workplace, even if you're not physically with people. Um, and so here I've put some examples of policies that have been shown to support uh, activity in the workplace. So if you're in a leadership position, these are policies that you can think about promoting or enacting uh, to support your employees. If you're an employee, you could think about are these some of these things you could advocate for with your supervisor? Um, so having uh, flexible work hours as long as you know people get done the job that they need to get done. Um, allowing some desi designated time to be physically active while you're technically you know on the clock. Uh, I think uh, employers sometimes are reluctant to embrace that idea. Um, but there's good evidence that allowing that time can help with morale and increase productivity rather than sort of forcing people to be chained to their desk for eight hours per day. Um, allowing casual dress, Zoom cameras optional when it's appropriate. Those are all things that can support uh, employees in moving more as they're working. Uh, these are some examples of online apps or resources, so I won't go through all of them. Again, if you want to take a screenshot or a picture, um, same as everything else, it's about finding something that resonates with you and is enjoyable and feasible for you. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that there are a ton of online resources out there. Um, and so don't uh, feel like you have to go to a gym or have a fitness center membership to be active. Um, walking is a great way to be active or uh, taking advantage of these resources. Um, and then the last thing I will mention is uh, thinking about or looking at how your environment is designed. If you're working from home, uh, is it designed in such a way that you're sort of making these healthy choices easier for you? So if you don't have a height adjustable desk, I think they're a great investment. Uh, the picture, the other photograph here is of me during the pandemic, not having a height adjustable desk, but sort of improv improvising and using a tub to be able to stand up. So uh, you can you can sort of make your own too if you don't feel like you're in a position to purchase one. Um, if you have goals, maybe to do something. Uh, with weights or stretching or walking, making sure that you have the equipment equipment that you need accessible to you in your environment can do a couple of things. One, it can serve as sort of a reminder or a prompt. Oh yeah, I see my dumbbell sitting right next to me or I see my yoga mat is already set up. Um, but then it also makes it easier so I don't have to take my time to go you know, look for that stuff. It's already right there for me to use it for just a minute or two when I need it. Um, so uh, what I hope that you'll remember um, from the presentation today is a couple things. Uh, thinking about what your why is, what's the reason to be active for you that aligns with the things that you value. Uh, identifying and choosing and prioritizing activities that you enjoy. Um, that, that can be different for everybody, but that is going to put you in a much better position to follow through if you're doing something that you look forward to. Uh, setting realistic goals, uh, again, starting small if needed and building up. Uh, thinking about it as every minute and every bit of activity that you do counts, so you might not feel like it's feasible to carve out 30 minutes in a row per day, but it might be feasible to do five minutes here and there uh, throughout the day. Continue to improvise and adapt. View this as a big experiment where some things will work and some things don't, uh, but it doesn't mean that you've failed. It just means that you need to keep trying until you find something that works for you. Um, and see if there are ways to create a support system both at home and at work to kind of support the goals that you want to achieve. 
So uh, thank you. My email address is here. I'm happy to field questions if you have them now or if you think of some later that you want to reach out. Uh, but I will stop sharing my screen and uh, take questions if you have them. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I absolutely love this. I, I'm going to use this today. I tell you, um, uh, my uh, you know powerful why for me when our daughter was getting married, you know, I, the father of the bride tried to slim down, and I did. I went to the wreck, and and it really made a difference. The, the wedding's passed, you know, and so. Uh, uh, but your point about frequency really strikes me. That I that I can't just work hard yesterday and then be good for a week. Um, one of those graphics said thirty and two. I mean, do you recommend a is once an hour? Uh, what what kind of frequency would be ideal? Yeah, so the thirty and two graphic comes from some of the colleagues that I've worked with at, through, at Workwell Kansas, um, which also focuses on supporting kind of help in the workplace, um, but that's a policy that they have enacted and recommend, which is just, so like if if you go to one of their trainings, they'll have a timer that goes off every 30 minutes and everybody will just get up and stand for two. Um, I think probably shooting, depending on your schedule, shooting for once an hour is probably a good place to start. That's really interesting. I, I, I appreciate it greatly. Any other questions? Is there, Is there any anything specific about adjustable height workspaces that need to be considered when making a purchase or making one of my own? I really like your high tech tub uh, <laughs> desk. That, that's my kind of technology there. <laughs> Yeah, so um, there's, I guess the the first thing that comes to mind is that if you get a height adjustable desk, um, don't go from sitting for eight hours to standing for eight hours right away. Um, the benefit of having the ones that adjust easily is that, you know, you can switch postures frequently throughout the day, which is what's recommended. So, um if you're having stiffness and soreness, breaking up your sitting time can help with that. But you could also go too far the other direction and have different types of stiffness or soreness if you go straight to standing all day. So that's one recommendation is just to um, change postures frequently. Um, I don't know. I've, I've used a couple of different models and, and different ones work better for... Um, your workspace or your personal setup. So, you know, like, I guess I would maybe play around with options, whether you're using a laptop and, you know, want your keyboard to be on the same level or a different level, there's options like that. There's some that go straight up and then there's some that go sort of like out. And so um, if you have an opportunity to kind of experiment with those or at least think about what the size and parameters of your space are i think um that's helpful for choosing a desk but yeah it doesn't have to be high tech if you go with the tub uh model i liked that because it was just i mean some people will like stack up books but so you can do anything but the tub was easy because it was just you know a few seconds to like move it out of the way or put the computer somewhere else so anything that's, that doesn't add a lot of burden is going to be more, you're going to be more likely to kind of stick with it and use it. And, David's and first one was a cardboard box. Uh, milk crate <laughs> actually worked for me for a while. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say if you're just, if you're just introducing it, pay attention to kind of your body's natural cues about when like if you feel restless stand up if, if your legs feel tired sit down some people feel like standing helps them concentrate more some people feel like when they're doing deep thinking work that's when they need to sit so there's not any one right way necessarily but figure out what works for you and just sort of pay attention to 
if you're mentally or physically feeling like you need to do something different, that's a good sign to switch. One of my colleagues has a, I don't know if it's a treadmill, a kind of a walking track thingy that she can actually walk while she's on Zoom. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. and that seems to work well for her. Yeah, I have a few colleagues that use those as well. I haven't used one, and it, but I think that's something that you adjust to. Um, and I get that same thing, like some people feel like they can type while they're doing that. Other people feel like it's just for if you're watching a Zoom or something like that. Any other questions? Well, I absolutely love this. This is going to be so helpful. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate it. I'm going to uh, try to give a virtual round of applause for Emily and uh, all of us. Uh, thank you, Emily, for these really useful steps and ideas, strategies that we can implement right away for our benefit of our health. So, so thank you very, very much. We appreciate it, Emily. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. And again, I'm happy to share resources. Um, if, um, if that's helpful, you can email me or I can make them available through your listserv or whatever. So just let me know. I appreciate it. And we will be uh, archiving this on the kansasremotework.org slash resources website. Just a quick uh, reminder about next month, uh, remote, remote Work Wednesday would be on July 10, 2024. Ashley Como is a young attorney, a young professional who's working remotely in the legal profession. So we're going to learn about some innovative things that they're doing to implement uh, remote and hybrid work in Kansas. With that, thanks again to Dr. Maley, and thanks to all of you. I hope you have a great Remote Work Wednesday. Thank you, Thank everyone. You.